How amazing is this? The car I'm driving right now, 1907 Renault, French racing car, and it's back home again. Tell them why it's home again, Donald. Today, we're driving down Bellevue Avenue in Newport, Rhode Island, where Willie K. Vanderbilt lived, and the one who ordered these cars new from Renault in 1907 for himself and his friends to go racing. And so we're bringing this car back to the house he moved into as a teenager in 1892. And so this will be an amazing homecoming for this astonishing car. I mean, everybody knows the name Vanderbilt from as being wealth and privilege, but they might not know that Willie Kay was one of the leading lights of American auto racing. I mean, he really started, it started almost on this street, didn't it? Exactly, Jay. It's a very funny thing because Willie K. Vanderbilt was many things and he could have just been a totally idle playboy. He was born incredibly rich, the third generation of wealth in the Vanderbilt family, but he had a passion for sailing and for cars. Well, that would be idle. <laughs> cars and sailing is about as idle rich as you can get, but that's okay because we're car people. So exactly. he's a hero to us. He's an absolute hero. He had, a, he had a day job. He was a vice president at the New York Central Railroad. So he had to go into the office every now and then. Right. But as soon as he was out of the office, he came to drive cars. And he wanted to also get all his friends involved with cars. That's the legacy that Willie Kay really left, is the fact that he brought motor racing to the public. Now this car is 1907. Now it might look primitive to you, but this is a very advanced racing car. Don't forget, the average human never probably went more than 10, 12, 15 miles an hour in his life. Maybe, hi guys! Maybe on a fast horse. This was capable of what, 70, 80 miles an hour? 70 miles per hour in 1907. And when you think about the fact that from the time cars were invented, engineers did their level best to make them go faster and faster, but nobody really thought about stopping a car until the mid, late 50s. Right. So it's really something that you have a car with this kind of power. I mean, this would be the equivalent of getting a Koenigsegg Regera or maybe even a Bugatti Chiron. I mean, this was about pretty much the fastest car in the world. Certainly the fastest car a, a regular person could buy, isn't it? Absolutely, and it's a really terrific thing that Willie Kay had the vision that auto racing, fast cars, to be something to be very, very popular, not only among his set of friends, the very wealthy uh, people who were first automobile enthusiasts, but also for the general public. Yeah. So he actually organized the first closed circuit race in the U.S. in Cranston, Rhode Island, and then started his Vanderbilt Cup race here in Newport, Rhode Island, in the old Aquidneck uh, race, Horse Race Club. And it's, it's almost hard to believe how advanced this car is. This car had, you know, the most old cars, certainly up until the early 20s, you had to advance and retard the ignition. This had automatic, uh, automatic timing, you, I guess you'd call it. It had a four-speed transmission with the most complicated gearbox. It's sequential here, but in the gearbox itself, it's an H pattern, so the number of forks, it's like watching a watch, opening the back of a watch and watching it all move. It's amazing how sophisticated this car is. The only primitive thing would be probably the suspension and I guess the brakes. But engineering wise, look at the little oilers up here that distribute oil throughout the engine. And this is a 100% original car. This is the actual car Willie drove, not one like, like it, it, the actual car. And we're going to his actual house now, aren't we? We are, we're going to Marble House, one of the great treasures of Newport, one of the great Newport cottages. Uh, today, it's owned by the Preservation Society of Newport that brings, that keeps these houses open and supports them so that generations after can come and appreciate them. And to bring this car back home is something absolutely special that no one else had the opportunity to do. And what's really amazing is, I just got in this car today and drove it. No lesson, no nothing, because it's it's quite modern. Obviously, the brakes are not modern at all, certainly. But hey, I'm shifting into high gear now. And it's got just stump pulling torque. It just pulled, but the fact we could drive around Newport all day and look at houses and, and, and go to lunch, and you could use this as a regular car. Exactly, as I'm sure uh, Willie did uh, to both amaze his friends 
and to probably horrify some of the neighbors. Well, this is my favorite era when you could buy a racing car and drive it on the street. And wow. here we are at Marvel House. You've come back home. Marble House takes its name not only from the soft gray Tuckahoe marble from New York State used for its exterior facades, but also for the extensive use of Italian yellow sienna and pink Numidian marble, among others, inside. Its completion marked the confirmation of the turn of architectural style in Newport from the wood and shingle style to that of stone, from casual vacation to opulent entertaining. Richard Morris Hunt, the first American to be admitted to the architecture course at the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris, brought authentically expressed French style to this commission. Typical of the Beaux-Arts type, the house is modeled on neoclassical elements which came into favor in France of the 17th and 18th century. In a clever use of sleight of hand and scale, what appears to be a two-story building in fact has four levels. It appears imposing, but not overwhelming. In addition to the Vanderbilt family, it was home to a staff of 36 servants. The interiors, by Jules Allard of Paris, are as lavish in decoration as the exterior is relatively restrained. Much like its French inspiration, it truly reveals itself once you are past the doors. It was reported in the press at the time that the cost of building Marble House was $11 million, roughly $300 million today, of which well over half was the cost of the half million cubic feet of marble. William K. Vanderbilt was the grandson of Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, who built a fortune on shipping and railroads. William's older brother, Cornelius Vanderbilt II, built the breakers nearby. His son, Willie Kay, enjoyed racing yachts, as did his America's Cup winning brother, Harold, but automobiles were his true passion, and by the time he moved into Marble House with his parents, he was already smitten by the bug. Their sister, Consuelo, was a noted beauty who married the ninth Duke of Marlborough in a union that brought a title to the Vanderbilts and financial salvation to the Marlboroughs. Their mother, Alva Vanderbilt, was a leading social figure in New York and Newport, and her force of personality and style made her a leader in that society. William Kay built Marble House for Alva, and in fact, in a time when many women did not hold property, gifted the new house to her in 1892. Apparently, it wasn't enough to save their marriage, and Alva divorced him in 1895 to marry a good friend of her husband's, Oliver Belmont, the following year. She moved a few blocks down Bellevue Avenue to Belcourt Castle, and for a time, closed Marble House. After Belmont's death in 1908, she reopened Marble House and it would become not only a social, but political center. A dedicated suffragette, Alva made Marble House the home of two major conferences to advance the cause of the right of women to vote. And her prominence and this commanding setting certainly gave great visibility to her work. After she relocated to France in 1919, Marble House would be closed until she sold it to Frederick H. Prince in 1932. The Newport Preservation Society acquired the home from the Prince Estate in 1963 through a donation of Harold Vanderbilt and Marble House, one of the most iconic of the Newport cottages and on the National Register of Historic Places since 1971, was designated a National Historic Landmark in 2006. Today, the Newport Preservation Society hosts thousands of visitors from around the world to this remarkable showplace. Imagine, in 1907, driving this around, I, I mean, First of all, there were hardly any. Uh, the Model T was still over a year and a half away. Absolutely. So most people had never, never even seen a car. Seen an automobile as opposed to riding in one. And to see something like this coming at you at 50 or 60 miles, I mean, it was. You know what used to happen? They used to have something called city to city races in Europe where they'd literally race on a public road. And they stopped them because people would go out on the road and look to see the car coming and. They'd Not have really no have, idea. And literally get mowed down because they couldn't get out of the way fast enough. You know, what they're used to seeing a horse galloping. Okay, well, I can stay here for a minute or two, you know. No, you can't, you know. And so many people were killed that they banned the city to city races. It literally must have been like watching a spaceship land in your, in your town yeah. to see a vehicle like this in 1907. And, and also thinking about what Newport represented. The fact that Newport was filled with people who had both the money and the imagination yeah. to really pursue their dreams, and they helped to build the automobile industry. You know, there's a great scene in the movie The Wild Bunch. Remember that? The same mm -hmm. It's a Western, and it's about the end of the Old West, 
and a bunch of cowboys are sitting in a saloon in a flat desert-like environment and a car goes by and they go, what the? They have no idea how the, there's no horse pulling. I mean, and it just, when you see that scene, you realize, wow, their, their era is over. And this was really the dawn of American, ra well, world racing. World racing, absolutely. Uh, this car was built in France. You know, Germany was the birthplace of the car, but they say France was the nursery. France is where all the sophisticated engineering came from, especially early on. And this is a classic example of one of the greatest race cars of all time. It's inspired by the Petit Trianon at Versailles. I thought those were those little finger cookies. No, no, no. Those are the larger ones that come oh, in the right. big tin. But, uh, but, you know, France fascinated the upper class in the U.S. And for a good reason. First of all, obviously, architecture design, the classical designs that were typical of French architecture are known, the Beaux-Arts School. Right. And here in this car, also, the French really were pioneers in technology at the time, and Willie Kay, who ordered this car, was fascinated by French cars. His very first car, which he bought at 20, was an 1898 Didion Bouton tricycle. Well, and it's, it's interesting to me how so many conventions, like now, we just assume the radiator goes in the front because they have been here, the radiator is behind the engine. And you'd think it would be picking up the heat from the motor. Uh, why do you, it's not, is it not aerodynamic, so this looks aerodynamic, but they do actually, the Renaults uh, pioneered this and they had it in all of their cars up to World War I. And actually it also gives better balance for the car as well. Right. Much like the uh, sort of a, mid, a front mid-engine car, the weight balance is absolutely in the center of the vehicle, which makes it much better to handle. Right. And also you do get a little frontal area, which is important now. I don't think they realized how important it was, right. but it had that extra added benefit, as well as not having all the weight uh, pointed over the front wheels. Like so. I, I think if you didn't know, you might uh, mistake this for an American Franklin. Franklin was air-cooled, but it had this same sort of hood treatment. Exactly. To, uh, to let everybody know that, yes, indeed, we are going to cool your engine, even though you don't see that formidable radiator. Let's take a look in the hood. Just yeah, let's do that. do that. Okay, you got your belt there. Belt here. And you've got to do the... Yeah, there we go. Okay. Perfect. Well, I hate to do this on a windy day, but... <laughs> well, it's a nice, clean piece of engineering. Here's your magneto right here. Uh, it's your crank to start it. There's no electric starter. That was invented till 1911. Is it an L head? I guess it is. It's an L head uh, inline four. So it's intake over exhaust. Right? Exactly. Right. Okay. And this opens up. There's a tool you can get right in there and see the piston, and you can also decarbonize it and clean it out, because which is a very necessary activity. Right. In the time. And, and these, these are priming cups. You, in cold weather, you put a little gas in here, you'd open that, that would send the gas directly into the cylinder. So when the spark came, there'd be fuel right there right away, because really be cranking a seven and a half liter motor, yeah. Although this car starts amazingly easily yeah. uh, for its time as well. I think a tribute to the, uh, the balance and the engineering of this car. And just the way every piece, you can tell as, as we go from sort of the, the blacksmith age into the automobile age, there's still a pride in workmanship, in the way each of the, the components is formed. The castings and, and the finishes are just absolutely amazing. Yeah, that's the amazing thing because this is still the era of the craftsman. The craftsman was gone by the time assembly lines came in. The idea was craftsmen were finicky, they were artists, they were expensive to hire, and they were slow. You know, when Henry Ford designed the Model T, he made sure every part fit perfectly so he didn't need craftsmen. He could just have guys, boom, just slam the part and put the hood on, slam the part so you could turn it on 100 cars an hour. Something like this probably took two weeks to build at a factory, minimum two weeks to build at a factory. But just beautiful, just beautiful. Willie Kay was also someone who really helped the automobile industry, and in this case, Renault, to really make their market in the U.S. because he saw the 1906 Renault Grand Prix cars and their great success and said, gee, not only do I want one of those, but said to the Renault factory, I can sell 10 of those. You can build 10 similar cars for me to sell to my friends. Right. And he did, much like uh, Max Hoffman did with Mercedes and the Gullwing. Right. And uh, so the idea that, that he was such a successful salesman because it was his passion. He could get his friends to say, I have so much fun doing this, you can too. 
and we can, bring, we can bring you a car that'll give you amazing performance. Now this particular car, of course, was never raced. And when you think about that, to have this kind of performance in a street car is right. astonishing. Yeah, it'd be like uh, getting uh, the GT, Ford GT that won them all and driving it on the street. I mean, it's basically what it was. But the fascinating thing about this is, if you found one of these in a barn 100 years from now, and you found a brand new 2020 car in a barn, this would be easier to get running. Absolutely. Because everything is self-sufficient. There's no real, well, there's wires to the ignition, but this is your whole electrical system, this right here. You spin that, you don't need a battery, you don't need a source of electricity. This makes its own electricity. You spin that, it gets a spark, and you go. I mean, it's fascinating, it's really interesting. You put a little gas in here, you spin that, and it starts. This could sit for 100 years and fire in a second. Modern cars, you need a computer, you need all this other stuff to assist you. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. And so it's small wonder that though, very few of these cars survive, it's believed that four of them survive, this is largely acknowledged as the most original of those cars. It's never been restored, it's been painted, right. um, but it's got all of its original components, engine, gearbox, rear axle, wheels, this is absolutely astonishing, as it was delivered in 1907. And whoever took care of it in the day did it properly. They must have drained the radiator because that's the original radiator. Normally, if radiator suits with water in it, the water will eventually just eat it and, and tear it apart. Whereas this still has the original radiator. This car has been in some of the greatest collections in history. Uh, George Waterman uh, found this car. He's one of the pioneer car collectors, sold it to James Melton, a great opera singer and also a pioneer car collector who had his Autorama Museum in uh, Long Island and later in Florida. And then it went to Bill Spear, the great driver for Briggs Cunningham. It was exhibited for a while in the Cun Briggs Cunningham Museum. And then it went to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum, right. where it lived for decades until being sold to private ownership and then uh, here to the Audrain Collection. That's right. Now, the Audrain Museum is here in Newport, which is great because this is a piece of Newport history and we just drove it on the exact same street that Willie Kay drove on with the same street lamps. I mean, that's what's fun about, you know, in California, things last 20 years and they tear it down. You come back east and there's history here, you know. Absolutely. It's real exciting. And living history. Right. We get to drive Willie Kay's car up to his house and that can't be duplicated anywhere else. Unfortunately, it's very windy here in Newport. I'm afraid this is going to turn into a... Yeah, we are by the sea after <laughs> into all. ...into a sail. Here we go. Let's put this back down. And shut this hood. Watching our fingers. Let's take a look at uh, some other Newport cars. A really interesting one over here, Jay. And of course, although we associate Newport with the Vanderbilts, the Vanderbilts were a big family. Sort of keeping up with all the Vanderbilt variations, it's sort of like a Porsche 911s, like the 962 and the 964. And right. It's, it's astonishing. Um, this marble house was William K. Vanderbilt's house. Right. His cousin, however, Cornelius Vanderbilt, built the Breakers. And this is a car, this 1941 Cadillac Series 75 Fleetwood limousine, was built for Gladys Vanderbilt, later Countess Zapari, right. uh, who was one of Cornelius's children. And so this is also a car which has lived its entire life in Newport. In fact, um, this car was stored in the barn of the Breakers for more than 60 years and came out. There was actually a fire in the barn, which did a little bit of damage to the car, which has never been restored. That's what I thought. This look a bit of scorching on the hood here. Yeah, exactly. I have to admit, these were never pretty cars to me. This 1941 was an odd for 39, 40. I liked the earlier 30s cars or even the 50s for about outlandishness. These just seemed sort of boaty and, and bulky. They didn't have the 16-cylinder engine anymore. It was a V8, certainly more efficient and probably easier to drive, but they don't seem as pretty to me. But I know a lot of people go crazy for 41s. It's true, and again, because it's a Cadillac. But a lot of people also who are great GM enthusiasts or just car enthusiasts in general think the 1939, 40, and 41 Buicks were really sort of the epitome of GM design and, and, and yeah. engineering achievement at the time. Nonetheless, it's a Cadillac. Yeah. And especially to see a car like this that has been preserved 
uh, is also a wonderful thing. Again, as we just brought the, uh, the Renault back to uh, Newport, this car has lived all of its life in Newport and now in the collection of the Audrain gets to celebrate the Newport history even further. Apparently, this car was used for Gladys's wedding as the Countess Sapari, and it actually has not covered more than 10 or 12 miles since that wedding. Wow. Now, what happened? Is this from the heat that cracked the glass, or what is that? It's from the heat, exactly. It's from the heat, and you can see also on part of the uh, roof on the other side, you can see where some of the paint is slightly bubbled. Oh, that's a um, shame. It's, it's absolutely astonishing. But again, you know, it's one of those things about the way the car shows its life. If this car could be completely restored, but then it wouldn't be the car that sat in the breaker's barn right. from the time of uh, the wedding. And it's a V8, about what, 150 yeah, It's a 5.7 liter yeah. uh, uh, V8 engine. Um, again, these cars were not known for their sparkling performance, right. um, but they were smooth, not as smooth as the contemporary Packards of the time. Right. Um, to your point, after the great cylinder wars of the 1930s, where a Cadillac really reigned supreme with their, with their V16. I mean, that's a really amazing, amazing car. But it's, um, it is a slight step backwards, but nonetheless, it still is something quite extraordinary to see when you look at the features of this car and just the, the, the sheer luxury of the car. I mean, this back seat is larger than many urban apartments. And this truly is the accommodation for a Vanderbilt. Now, a lot of people know Anderson Cooper, the famous CNN uh, newsman. He is a Vanderbilt. He is a Vanderbilt and from this part of the Vanderbilt right. family. And he exactly. actually, I guess he lived in the house. His mother lived there. And I guess he grew up there part of the time. He grew up there part yeah. of the time. There was an apartment uh, at the top of the Breakers that was reserved to the Vanderbilt family until quite recently. Right. Um, the Preservation Society is doing some work in the house, and so they no longer use that apartment. But it is, again, the fact that these houses have a living history, and that's what's so important about what's happening here in Newport. And of course, the famous Cadillac, everybody had a hood ornament back in the day, preferably something with wings and yeah, yeah. Exactly, something that made you think of speed and, and, and flight right, right. when the car was standing still. Right. So it's an astonishing thing. And uh, our next stop on the Newport Vanderbilt look is to imagine what Willie Kay might have driven if he was around now. You know, I'm, I was interested, when I saw the car we're going to look at in just a minute, I was like, well, this doesn't fit in here. It doesn't seem like part of it. But when you explain it like that, this is what Willie Kay would drive now, then it makes perfect sense. Come on, let's take a look. Absolutely. Well, it does seem funny to see this car here, but it's, this is probably what Willie Kay would drive, isn't it? Absolutely. This is a Porsche GT2 RS Club Sport, and this is a, a Porsche customer race car right. for a special series that uh, Porsche customers can drive in. And it's exactly the kind of thing that Willie Kay, if he was around today, would get together with a bunch of his friends and say, let's buy this race car and just go and have fun. Is it street legal? This is not street legal, as opposed to the Renault. Right. Um, but nonetheless, it still is, is, a, is a race car that is actually tractable enough to drive on the street. Right, right. Which is so, my favorite kind of race. I mean, I love the days when you could drive a race car to Le Mans, race it, and then drive it home, which Jaguar did back in the 50s. They actually drove the race cars to the track and then modifications and do it, and then drove them. I mean, it's amazing. And even, even um, when they arrived at the track, Typically, they didn't have the big paddock facilities that you see today in the tracks. They rented local garages and they would drive right. their race cars from the local garage to the track with all the kids in the street cheering them on and, and all well, that. Well, that's why F1 is not that interesting to me because it's like space flight. It's so above an airplane technically and scientifically and every other kind of thing and expense wise that it's sort of out of the realm. The idea that you could have a streetcar, you could actually race, to me, that's the most exciting era. Wow. And the fact that this looks like, although it shares very few parts with, it looks like a 911 that you can see driving down the street every day. Well, it is a 911. I mean, you could, I suppose you could 
get this body work, put it on your 911, and convince people it's a club squad. You wouldn't have the 700 horsepower no, and, the, no. and, and the over 500 foot-pounds of torque that this puts out. Well, look how light this door is. Incredibly I mean, lightweight. It weight. doesn't weigh any. Is this alum aluminum or fiber? It's, it's carbon fiber. Carbon, fi oh, carbon course, fiber. Carbon fiber. Of course. Yeah, carbon, carbon fiber. fiber. Yeah. And carbon fiber is used throughout the car. You can see, obviously, in the hood panel, the roof panel, where it's unpainted and it's just sealed for both the look and for the fact that it's an important structural part of this car. You got the fire suppression system right here. You hit that button, it just floods the cabin with, you know, uh, flame retardant, whatever it is. I don't know what it is, but it puts, <laughs> it puts the fire. Puts the fire. Yeah, out. exactly. But, you know, you can just imagine the excitement that the sort of everyday driver could get driving one of these cars. Obviously, you have to take lots of lessons in order to learn to drive this car well and fast. Right. As, um, as is offered by Porsche. But it is that whole idea of putting customers into race cars. Right. Just as Renault did back in 1907. And it's quite interesting that you can still do this today in a way that is approachable. Right. Well, and uh, it, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about what Willie Kay did and the performance of that Renault uh, as compared to contemporary cars. This is a 700 horsepower uh, racing Porsche, but there are 1,000 horsepower and 1,200 horsepower street cars. Right. So the race cars are not so much about pure power today. It's about the combination of power, weight, yeah. uh, handling, uh, air management, things that uh, the Renault engineers didn't, couldn't even comprehend. Right, right. But uh, it's fair to say, compared to what was around, it's a pretty good comparison. That was the race car, fastest car of the day. This is one of the fastest cars of today. Exactly. So we uh, took a ride in the Renault. Uh, shall we take a ride in this one? Uh, yeah, it's only got one seat, though. You know oh. something? I I'm going to give you my Uber. They'll be by. Let me get out in the street. I will make the call, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have them come get you. What about me? Unbelievable. There he goes. Willie K. Leno. How do I get in this thing? Hang on a minute. Is that seat even back all the way? Here, Antonio. 